Right, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and also so many new faces too. Um, so it's great getting to, we just moved to Montpelier ourselves a year and a half ago now, so it's fun to facility meet everybody, um, you know, one presentation at a time. So I um, uh, just want to make a couple of announcements and a couple of quick thank yous. Um, first of all, I want to um, say a big thank you to our sponsors um, for our whole Naturals Journey series this year, um, Hunger Mountain Co-op, whose reputation precedes them. Um, Hunger Mountain Co-op has been great to us over the years, um, and we're delighted to have them uh, underwriting Naturals Journeys. And also this year, um, GreenVest is another one of our major underwriting sponsors for our Naturalist Journeys. Um, they're a uh, sustainable, uh, or they're a socially and environmentally responsible investing um, company that is new to town here. Uh, at least they have a branch that's new to town here. And, uh, and so we've been getting to know them a little bit and they're delighted to, to uh, help support what we do here. So thanks to GreenVest as well. A um, couple of quick announcements about other upcoming programs that we have coming up. So um, last week, um, the blizzard uh, unfortunately canceled uh, Chris Shadler's Eastern Coyote talk, uh, but that's rescheduled to next Friday, the 28th. So if you want to come and uh, learn about the real Eastern Coyote from Chris Shadler, um, please do join us. I've heard her presentations uh, be compared to those of Jane Goodall, so um, so I hear she puts on a good show. So um, come back uh, next next week for Chris Shadler. Also, the week after that, March sixth, um, our our uh, very own local Charlie Cogwell is going to be here talking about his research into <laughs> pre-settlement forests and uh, okay, kind yeah. of uh, telling us about what our um, northern forests look like. Um, several hundred years ago based on all the research that he's been doing over his entire career. And um, then a couple weeks after that, it's our last naturalist during his presentation, uh, March 20th, and that's by um, Kai Koich, who is um, relatively new to the Mad River Valley, uh, but he's been studying moose in Yellowstone and Isle Royale for the last many, many years, um, and is a friend of many, of many of us around the area, and so we're delighted to have him here too. So keep coming back. Um, several more present Naturalist Journeys presentations to go. Um, I uh, also want to say a big thank you to, um, to the Northeast Wilderness Trust for, um, for making this all possible tonight. Um, Northeast Wilderness Trust has been a great um, kind of partner organization for us to work with over the last few years here. Um, we were uh, just kind of chatting over the last couple of months. Um, uh, the Wilderness Trust is, is kind of working to uh, think about uh, carbon wilderness-based carbon offset programs, um, and uh, we here have been thinking about how can we offset the carbon of our adventures afar, our trips that we do around the world, go birding and that sort of thing. And so we're really excited to be partnering so that uh, the trips that we start offering in the future can be um, completely offset um, by wilderness-based um, offsets. So um, excited for that conversation to progress, and thank you guys for um, for um, helping make that happen. Um, so without um, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sophie from the Wilderness Trust to introduce Tyler. Thanks, Sean. Thank you so much, Sean. We're really delighted to be here at the North Branch Nature Center. Um, I've been to several of these presentations myself, and I'm so excited to hear Tyler's presentation. Um, the, I'm just going to give our quick spiel for those of you who maybe haven't heard of Northeast Wilderness Trust before. Uh, my name is Sophie. I am the outreach coordinator uh, for our organization. We're a small group of six staff. Uh, our main base is right here in Montpelier, but we only have one person who works in Massachusetts. And we work all over the Northeast and the Adirondacks, uh, and we protect wilderness in these places. Um, so far, we've protected more than 35,000 acres uh, across the Northeast. Um, and working across this region, we are the only land trust that protects specifically forever wild places. So what that means is that every place that we protect uh, will not be logged or cut in any way. Um, and so in the future, the, each place that we protect, each of those 35,000 acres will be a future old growth forest. Um, which is pretty incredible when you think about mm -hmm. how much old growth exists right now in the Northeast. Um, we are part of trying to see uh, the future of the Northeast region become a place where 10% of the forests are wild places. Um, and this is important uh, for us. Our mission is sort of to do this for nature for its own sake first. Um, and of course, we as people have so many benefits from that, such as clean water, clean air, all the wildlife we get to encounter. 
and the experiences of being in the wild for 7,000 miles or more. Um, and, and we like to think about um, what's, what's happening on the land for the plants and the animals and the mushrooms and everything else first. Um, so thank you so much for having us. Um, before I introduce Tyler, I just wanted to make one other announcement. We just learned that we'll be the recipient of um, Caledonia Spirits Benefit Program next month. Um, so our <laughs> we're really excited. Um, we love that they, as, as Montpelier residents, we love that they do this for local nonprofits like the North Branch. Um, and uh, so we're going to be having staff uh, social cocktail hours. So if you want to stop by on Wednesdays between 4 and 4.30 at the bar, we'll be hanging out. And hope, uh, we're hoping just to like meet and chat with people and tell people about wilderness and um, enjoy some really delicious drinks. Um, so maybe we'll see you there. Um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Tyler, who works at the Adirondack Mountain Club, a place very dear to my heart as well. Um, he works in the Outdoor Education Program Management, um, and he's here to tell us about hiking 7,000 miles across the West Coast, the East Coast, and New Zealand. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Sophie. So, thank you, first and foremost, North Branch Nature Center. This is my second time here. And this building is incredible. Uh, I'm very happy and thrilled to be back. Thank you, Sean and Allison, for welcoming me today. Really appreciate it. And Sophie, thank you and the Northeast, Northeast Wilderness Trust. I cannot think of a better chance to fight for wilderness than with a beverage in your hand. <laughs> so I'm really excited to share about my little walk in the woods with you all. And I'll, I'll stick around for questions at the end. So my name is Tyler Sokash. I grew up in the Adirondack State Park just across Lake Champlain. If you look out into the distance to the west, you'll see the Adirondack Park. And my parents still live in a little town called Old Forge, New York. Uh, I've got a younger brother who still lives there as well. And I now live a little closer to Lake Placid, but still consider myself a, a local of the Adirondacks for sure. And I grew up hiking, fishing, paddling mountain biking the trails around Old Forge, and even going to the Enchanted Forest Water Safari where the fun never stops. But that's, a, that's another story. So I'll talk a little bit about my background before I get into the walk in the woods. Uh, this is a self-deprecating picture of me with a sippy cup in my hand, hiking Bald Mountain, one of our local ma fire tower mountains in the Adirondacks. And I didn't realize it at the time when I was young that I was privileged enough to grow up in the largest protected land area in the lower contiguous 48 states. At 6.1 million acres, maybe some of us might not even know it now, um, even though we're just across Lake Champlain. Right over there is the Adirondack Park, the biggest park in the lower 48. But 6.1 million acres, what does that mean? If you combine five heralded national parks, Great Smoky Mountains on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee, add on Glacier National Park, in Montana, Yellowstone, predominantly in Wyoming, Yosemite in California, and finally, toss in the entire Grand Canyon of Arizona. If you add those five together, they easily fit inside of the Adirondack Park. You can fit the state of Vermont inside <laughs> of the Adirondack. 6.1 million acres is a lot. Um, oftentimes, when we think of our favorite memories of exploring outside, they're often intertwined with wildlife encounters. And when I was younger, actually while hiking along the shoreline of Lake George, not too far from Vermont, uh, in the southeastern Adirondacks, I was startled by a family of frolicking fishers bounding over a downed hemlock tree. And I had never in my life seen a fisher before. I was thrilled beyond belief, and that memory is still seared in my mind. It's sometimes hard to realize that when you're in the Adirondack State Park that has 103 vibrant, thriving, small town communities interspersed throughout the park's borders, you sometimes forget that this isn't just a playground for you, it's also home for the 53 mammals that call the Adirondacks home, the 35 amphibian and reptile species, and the 200 plus avian species that will migrate through. So this, seeing wildlife and realizing that it calls the same place home as I do, that meant a lot to me when I was younger. And perhaps it was that connection with wildlife that 
got me into outdoor education. I started working at the Adirondack Mountain Club in 2009. And while at the Adirondack Mountain Club, I met great people who also loved uh, exploring nature and going outside. One of my colleagues, Seth Jones, and I, we'd, we'd done it all. We'd, we'd hiked the 46 high peaks, those 4,000 foot peaks across the Adirondack High Peaks region. We had both paddled the 90 miler, the 90 mile Adirondack Canoe Classic from my hometown of Old Forge to the village of Saranac Lake. And we'd even done the Fire Tower Challenge, climbing the 25 Fire Tower peaks in both the Adirondack State Park and the Catskills. So what else was there to do? We set off to hike the 136.8, and you can't forget about the .8 mile Northville Placid Trail. I know, it's a little bit shorter than the long trail, uh, but it's our very own through hike across the Adirondacks, and I'd never done something like this before. It was the year 2014, and I had never gone on a long distance backpacking trip, and maybe that can resonate with some of you now in this room. So I'd never done this before. I was green, fresh to this idea. We set off to do it. Halfway down the trail, my colleague Seth injured his ankle. He was unable to continue, but I said goodbye to him, persevered through the High Peaks Wilderness, and when I came out on the other side into Lake Placid, New York, at the northern terminus of the trail, I saw through the trees, it was May, the, the foliage hadn't popped yet, I could see the tower of the atmospheric Right, uh, the, the Atmospheric Science Center on top of Whiteface Mountain, the fifth tallest peak in New York State. And it was in that moment while the sun was glinting off that tower that I realized, holy cow, I just walked here from Great Sacandaga Reservoir in Northville, New York at the bottom of the park. And it gave me a reckless sense of self-confidence. <laughs> reckless enough to consider and on the, on the heels of this through hike across the Adirondack State Park, I, I was back at work and in grad school in Rochester, New York, New York State's third largest city. And while I was in my cubicle in the day and living in squalor with five other guys, including my brother, in a house in downtown Rochester at night, I started to envision an idea in my head. I thought, what if I hike the Pacific Crest Trail? The Pacific Crest Trail. 2,650 miles from the 49th parallel at the U.S.-Canadian border, traversing its way through 48 wilderness areas, seven national parks, multiple national monuments, to Campo, California, abutting against the border of Mexico. But then I had the audacity to then Google, does New Zealand have a through-hiking trail? And they do, since 2011. Te Aroa, in the Maori indigenous language, that translates to the long pathway. The long pathway, 3,007 kilometers from the tip of the North Island at Cape Reinga to the tip of the South Island at a town called Bluff. But then I had the gall to type into the Google machine, how long does it take to hike the Appalachian Trail? The venerable AT at 2,189 2, miles traversing 14 states, two national parks, 25 wilderness areas, starting at Springer Mountain the southern terminus in Georgia, to Katahdin, the highest peak in Maine. I was ostensibly earmarking dollars that I was saving at work to buy my first vehicle. I wanted to buy a 2015 Subaru Crosstrek, a tangerine one with a sleek interior, <laughs> high clearance for the northeast snows. But then this idea popped into my brain. And I had to ask myself, do I want to stare out of my attic window at a 2015 Tangerine Subaru Crosstrek, or did I want to pursue something bold? And when I did the math, I added up the, the flights, the new gear, feeding myself for a year. I hit enter on the calculator, and fortuitously enough, the dollar amount on my calculator was the sticker price of the Crosstrek. So I quit my job, <laughs> went to Rochester International Airport. It was actually right before that, before leaving. I did decide to test my strength, to test my stamina. There's another new through hike. It's actually a loop hike in the northwestern Adirondacks, not too far west from Tupper Lake along State Route 3 on the way to Watertown. I tried to test my skills and my gear on the Cranberry 50. There's a 50-mile loop hike around the lake 
who do you employ for such a task? But my colleague Seth Jones was bold enough to come back with me once more. You realize things. You realize, I need a new tent. I need to put batteries in my headlamp. So before you embark on a long journey, it's definitely a good idea. Before you endeavor to try a marathon, sign up for a 5K first. <laughs> Make sure you've got what it takes before you hit the trail. So I leave Rochester, New York. And as I'm flying to SeaTac between Tacoma and Seattle, and we're on our descent, and we've put our tray tables up and our seat backs in the upright position, I tapped the guy next to me who was fortunate enough to get the window seat. And I said, hey, do you mind opening that window? Because I, I had never seen the, this landscape before. I wanted to see what it was like. And voila, out of the passenger window on the airplane, you could see certain stratovolcanoes like Mount Rainier. It's a little bit harder to see, but Mount Adams. And even further, with the naked eye, you could see Mount Hood, the tallest peak in Oregon. And I had to say to myself, oh my goodness, I'm about to walk through these valleys past these behemoths. When you start on the Pacific Crest Trail, it's not much unlike stumbling your way through a Dr. Seuss book. You begin in the Pasayten Wilderness that abuts against the US-Canadian border. It has the largest denizen population of lynx in the lower 48 US states. And you start through the Pasayten Wilderness. You make your way past Hopkins Lake, past, past Blizzard Peak to an obelisk at the very border with Canada. And it's in that moment that you realize, oh my goodness, I'm about to walk to Mexico. If you can be so lucky, because only 20% make it. As you go southbound on the Pacific Crest Trail, you walk through beautiful wilderness areas in the state of Washington, chiefly the Granite Peak, uh, Glacier, excuse me, this is the Glacier Peak Wilderness, and past Lake Chelan, the third deepest lake in the country. You do dangerous things like putting your feet over perilous precipices, jumping into lakes like Lake Micah that just had their ice out, and doing things like the Kendall Catwalk that I didn't tell my mom about until I got home. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, Tyler, what was singularly your favorite moment from the Pacific Crest Trail? And uh, this sunset behind Mount Rainier sure, surely ranks highly on my list. It was like I experienced a Crayola crayon canvas of color. And it was here that I decided to embrace the challenge provided by our wilderness areas in the United States. I thought, here, if I can hike through the night, I'll make it to the heart of the Goat Rocks wilderness by sunrise. <coughs> Clamoring over steep arets and behind some snow fields, I made it. You could see elk in the valley below. You could see Mount Rainier to the northwest, Mount Adams to the southeast, and looming in the distance was, of course, Mount St. Helens, with the top third of its summit blown to smithereens. I was encircled by wildness. Couldn't believe that two weeks before this, I was in a cubicle. And it, I was brought to tears. So wilderness areas do a number of things for us that we don't think about every day. They clean our water. Wilderness areas clean our air. And m m way up there, they also provide a home for wildlife so that they can live out a free-willed existence and raise their young in a safe, secure, intact, vast habitat. We want those things. And despite the odds, making it to Oregon meant a lot to me. I almost quit the trail in Washington State due to blisters, low morale being away from my family. You make a lot of unspoken sacrifices when you do a long hike, even on the long trail of Vermont. You miss anniversaries, you miss weddings, you miss funerals, you miss family events, you miss the people back home. So you do have to endure a lot of mental toil on the trail. But luckily, making it to Oregon, I met someone who changed my perception of this journey. It became less self-serving in this moment when I stepped into Timberline Lodge, opened by FDR in the 1930s on the slopes of Mount Hood. And it's also the exterior shots of The Shining. So you've probably all seen it before. <laughs> and when you walk into this gorgeous, vast building, uh, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith actually just took off in a helicopter right before I walked in. So I was, I was already starstruck. <laughs> but I, I see someone else who I recognize, someone from Backpacker Magazine. With his sunburnt skin and sinewy physique, it was Billy Goat, the, the historic thru-hiker who had hiked the Pacific Crest Trail 10 times. And I marched right across the dining room and introduced myself to Billy Goat. And 
sitting down at the breakfast buffet, and nothing looks better for a through hiker than a breakfast buffet. <laughs> sitting down at the breakfast buffet with Billy Goat, I asked him a similar question. Billy Goat, what's singularly your favorite moment from all of your long distance hiking? And he turns to me, and it's as if someone dims the lights, muffles the sound, and he goes, do you want to know the single greatest thing that I've ever seen? So there I was in the Great Basin of Wyoming on the Continental Divide Trail, when suddenly, out in the fields in front of me, there were not one, but 200 wild horses galloping in the fields below. Suddenly, one of them broke off from the pack down from a canter into a trot right up to me. That horse shook its mane right at me. And do you want to know what that horse said? Not in English, mind you. That horse said to me, come on, come play with me. Do you want to know what I said back? And I actually had chocolate chip pancakes oozing out of the corner of my mouth, waiting at bated breath for his next sentence. And he said, in English, mind you, I said to that horse, I would, but I can't run that fast. <laughs> so Billy Goat starts to teach me that the trail's more than this self-serving pilgrimage. Billy Goat starts to teach me that you're going to be sharing these public lands with wildlife that call them home. And he was humble enough to give wildlife the space it needed to live out a free willed existence in that incredible wild place. He was humble enough to preserve the mystery of that moment. Let the horses be. Despite the odds, you make it through Oregon. You see great things like, gosh, climbing the lightning rod of the Cascades, Mount Thielsen. Jumping in to the deepest lake in the contiguous 48 states, Crater Lake, Oregon's sole national park. You jump over the sun in the Sky Lakes Wilderness area. <laughs> but as you begin to put the cascades in your rearview mirror, you're staring down from the summit of Sonora Pass here. You eclipse 10,000 feet just above the pass for the first time. You're staring down John Muir country in the Sierra Nevada range. And as you walk through these white rock valleys of Yosemite National Park, Kings Canyon National Park, Sequoia National Park, you feel like an ant at the base of a chalice. These are our public lands. Assuming you have the ability to travel that far from Vermont, you could go see these places too. And Muir Hut at 11,000 feet or the outlet of Arrowhead Lake are just a glimpse of the beauty that our public lands possess. Uh, but the trail is more than views. You sometimes walk these arbitrary paths with people who are going the same direction as you, and you form trail families that help enhance the experience. In my trail family, we dubbed ourselves the Wrong Way Gang. All the North Founders passed us 2,000 strong. Only 90 of us were going south. So the wrong way gang and I persevered, pressed on. We did the eight mile side trip to the summit of Mount Whitney at 14,505 feet, the tallest summit in the lower 48. And as the sun crested the horizon over Death Valley National Park, we sang in unison, oh say can you see? I would say that I, uh, I would argue that I, I never felt more alive than while hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, and I uh, honestly, I never felt more American. And when you end through the Sierras, you still have 703 miles of the Mojave and the Borrego deserts in an ecosystem that's so foreign to us here in the Northeast. And it, it made for a wonderful finale. But when you make it to the border, and when you have that newfound patriotism, you have to leave the country and head to New Zealand. <laughs> And I promised myself when I had saved that money and I didn't buy that Subaru Crosstrek, I had enough money to fly to New Zealand and start Tamaroa, the long pathway. Now, instead of a Dr. Seuss book, it honestly feels like you're lumbering through Middle Earth. <laughs> so if you're thinking about going to New Zealand, the North Island is truly a pastoral paradise. And there's some beach walking, too. Um, and you start off by actually trekking down the 90 mile beach. You trek across the country through uh, the bush, as they call it in New Zealand, and you're not trekking, you're tramping. 
And when you get across the bush, you end up at the Pacific Ocean. And so it's really a wonderful experience being along the Tasman Sea, the Pacific Ocean. But then when you get to the heart of the North Island, it turns into this tremendous volcanic landscape. Uh, it's called Tongariro National Park. It's the sixth ever protected national park in the world. Um, Mount Narahoe is actually the filming location of Mount Doom, where Frodo pucks that ring in, into the bottom of the volcano. I would say that my favorite part of trekking across the North Island was the trail family that I made there. And I think what really distinguishes Tealaroa from other long trails is that it's actually an international experience. In my trail family were people from, of course, New Zealand, but also Australia and Switzerland, France, Germany, other Americans too. Uh, but these people who come from different backgrounds, who have different beliefs, who have different sets of ideas, they truly challenge you to be the best possible version of yourself even if you don't recognize it at the time. So I'm tremendously thankful for the immersion experience that Tataroa provided me. My favorite moment along the North Island Tataroa, the long pathway, was the Wanganui River journey, when you actually trade your hiking boots for a canoe and a paddle. And as you work your way southbound back to the Tasman Sea, you paddle by beautiful waterfalls, you paddle by beautiful embankments and escarpments, but what really made this moment special was when we pulled our canoes ashore to a marae, a Maori community center. And Pituari, the tribal leader there, greeted my trail family and welcomed us into the forfeit or welcoming ceremony, invited us into the marae itself and went into his ancestral talk. Kauri trees, New Zealand's old growth Kauri trees. They once touched the sky. And then the Europeans came and they cut down our cowrie trees to build the great cities of Christchurch and Auckland, Dunedin. But my 101 non-seller ancestors chose not to bargain away the cowrie trees you see here. Do you want to know why the 101 ancestors chose to be non-sellers? It's because these trees made my ancestors a promise. These trees spoke to my ancestors and said, if you do not cut us down, we will never cut you down. Pituari taught me something about planetary modesty. And as you get through the tower ranges and hop on a boat in Wellington, you go across the Cook Strait, suddenly this trail is transforming me. You begin to realize when you enter places like Nelson Lakes National Park in the South Island that protected tracts of land don't miraculously protect themselves. It takes the passionate conviction of people, people like Pituari's ancestors, people like you all, to protect land. So I mentioned that the North Island was pastoral paradise. The South Island is backpacker's bliss. You go above tree line. You walk across three wired bridges in four rivers like the Rakaia. You get to still do those classic things like herd sheep. <laughs> Jump into glacial lakes, and you'll see wildlife like kias, the world's only alpine parrot. Things that you've never experienced in your life, but yet again you're seeing world heritage sites, national parks, you're going along these great walks in New Zealand. Inimitable resources that people made the proactive, long view decision to protect land. What? Darn it, I made myself a promise, and I didn't buy that car? So when the trail ends, I had to wave goodbye to my New Zealand friends, fly to Atlanta, Georgia, and hitchhike my way to Amapola Falls, and walk up to Springer Mountain, the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. The, the plaque reads, a footpath for those who seek fellowship with the wilderness. And that's the very first white blaze, of course, that delineates your path to Katata. You'll see a lot of those. The American Southeast is spectacular. You traverse these enchainments of southern balds that are exposed. You actually go through fields of wildflowers, and even in Grayson Highlands in southern Virginia, you walk through a little paradise with, filled with feral ponies. And you can't help but remember everything that Pituari and Billy Goat are telling you about how magical our public lands truly are. Of course, you see those iconic scenes like McAfee's Knob, Buzzard Rocks, Shenandoah National Park. But as you enter 
the Mid-Atlantic? You're never out of earshot of planes, trains, automobiles. You don't walk through any wilderness areas, Maryland, Pennsylvania. And the spirit of wildness begins to fade. And then you enter New Jersey. <laughs> you see birds of prey soaring over the Delaware River. Porcupines amble across your path, and black bears too. And you begin, as you work your way from New Jersey, along the Kittatinny Range to High Point, Wallpale Wildlife Refuge, into New York State, Harriman State Park, Connecticut, the Housatonic River Valley, Bear Mountain, Massachusetts, Sages Ravine, Mount Everett. Then you get all the way up to Greylock, see the sunset there. You enter this interconnected patchwork of motor-free landscapes. They're getting a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger as you progress into Vermont. The Lybrook Wilderness Area, Glastonbury Wilderness Area. You work your way into New Hampshire, the Presidential Range Dry River Wilderness Area. You begin to experience that same magic that you felt on the Pacific Crest Trail right here in the Northeast once again. I felt like I was fortunate enough to embrace a fair share of wildness on this journey, <laughs> both physically, spiritually, emotionally. Of course, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, sunny, visually, people on the trail, fantastic. Dogs, a little bit more of them. But then you get to the 100 mile wilderness of Maine, and for once in a long while, you see this vast tract of unbroken forests, the likes of which you haven't seen since the Satan wilderness in Washington State or in the Sierra Nevadas through the Cascades of the West Coast. And when you finally make it to Katahdin, you know, it's really tough to end a long trail. <coughs> Uh, and it's, it's harder still when you were blessed to finish three. And I started to ask myself, how have I changed? How can I articulate, or excuse me, this is a, what a fortuitous word to grow up on. How, how do you articulate the value of wildness to others? And what the heck color Subaru did I want to get again? That matters less. But I did get a call from the Adirondack Mountain Club uh, just outside of Lake Placid, New York. I was blogging at the time about my journey, going through that transformation internally. And they called me and said, well, apparently you still really like to hike. <laughs> and so they invited me back to be an outdoor educator. And we, along with my colleagues, we execute this program called the Three Seasons at Heart Lake. And I know the North Branch Nature Center host similar naturalizing programs out here. And the goal, connect kids with nature. When you begin to foster an appreciation for a place, you can begin to value that space. And also, you maybe can begin to love it. So we take kids up our little mountain, Mount Joe. They summit the mountain for the first time. That exaltation is spectacular. They snowshoe for the first time in the winter on Heart Lake, which is frozen right now, of course. And in the spring, we work on our map and compass skills together as we traverse the property. So I saw the value in education. I thought, what, what else can I do? The Adirondack Mountain Club is a provider of all forms of leave no trace education. And I wanted to take it a step further. Every single time I go out on an adventure on public lands, I do my best to bring back the things that don't belong there. You know, once in a while you'll find micro trash on the trail. It's usually accidental. Sometimes you'll find a little bit more nefarious marks on the trail here or there. You pick those up too. And I started to realize the value in making a place look beautiful again. Uh, education was a great place to start, so I started to dig a little bit deeper. And I started to juxtapose in my mind, why was the Pacific Crest Trail seemingly so much wilder than the Appalachian Trail? And the answer is in the numbers. On the AT, you cross a road every four miles, which means you can only walk into the woods for two before you're already coming back out. On the Pacific Crest Trail, you only walk through four towns. And when you look at our federal and state protected wilderness areas, you can start to surmise a startling statistic. East of Denver, 
only 1% of our landscape is protected as motor-free wilderness. That's if you add state, federal, and tribal wilderness areas. We do a little bit better west of the Colorado Rockies, but in the lower 48, less than 3% of our land is motor-free wilderness. If you were to add all of those wilderness areas together, it would easily fit inside of the state of Minnesota. The culprit, of course, roads. Roads are important. Uh, they, got, they got me here tonight. <laughs> but there are 4.12 million miles of motorized roadways across the United States of America. And with every bifurcated habitat comes an impact that I don't think we can conceptualize in our daily lives, but when you really zoom out the microscope and think back to 420 years ago before Jamestown, certainly the natives of the Americas lived in a harmonious relationship with the land, it certainly altered it. But in terms of motorized recreation, things have certainly changed a lot in the past 400 years. And when you look at a night sky image of the United States, um, things also become a little more apparent and civilized. You see a few dark spots, though, uh, chiefly the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas wilderness area, the largest wilderness east of the Mississippi, uh, the Boundary Waters wilderness in northern Minnesota, and the third largest is actually the High Peaks wilderness area in the Adirondacks with Oki Pinoki swamps straddling Florida and Georgia. Uh, it's appropriate that I mentioned Florida a few times. There's a couple from Florida doing this project called Project Remote, where they're calculating the most remote spot remaining in all 50 states. And they've actually been to the 14 states that the AT traverses. And if you do the math, excluding a few outliers that have uh, roadless islands in the middle of the Atlantic, along the AT, the most remote spot in any state on average is about four miles. Four miles away is how far you can walk into the woods uh, getting away from the sounds of civilization. I'll highlight Vermont real quick at 2.6 miles. Uh, that spot, that remote spot in Vermont, is near Bourne Pond, just west of uh, Stratton Mountain in the Lybrook Wilderness Area. That's your most remote spot left, is 2.6 miles from the road. So I started to think about this uh, because I'm from the Adirondacks, and I wanted, to, I wanted to have an impact here. I wanted this walk to mean something for other people. So along with a group called the Adirondack Wilderness Advocates, we calculated the most remote spots remaining in New York State. It's no surprise that those spots are all in the Adirondacks. And what you're seeing highlighted in red are the areas in which you can get three miles or more away from a road or snowmobile trail. Only 5% of the Adirondack landscape is more than three miles away from mechanized recreation. And I want to draw our attention to one spot in particular, Boreas Pond. It's actually one of the newest additions to New York State's Forest Preserve, our, our state protected public lands. And for a long time, this is my favorite spot in the world. Boreas Pond is beautiful. It's the largest high elevation wetland complex in New York State. So there's only one of them. It's not too far south of Mount Marcy, New York State's tallest peak. That's Gothics, actually, in the background, for those of you who have hiked over in the Adirondacks and saw teeth just obscured by the trees there. It was a place, when it became publicly accessible in 2016, that I fell in love with real quick. I visited five times in all the seasons. And when the Adirondack Park Agency was going to decide the fate of this newly purchased land, would it become wilderness, forever wild, motor free? Would it become another roadside picnic area? The APA, or Adirondack Park Agency, was about to decide. And the day before they were going to make the decision, uh, along with the Adirondack Wilderness Advocates, we collected 1,882 petitions and put them in my backpack. And I wanted to walk. 47 miles from the beginning of the Boreas Ponds track, Boreas Ponds are located here, through the High Peaks Wilderness Area just over the shoulder of Mount Marcy, out along the Northville Placid Trail where this whole story started for me, and six miles of roadway to Raybrook, New York, where the APA would decide to take the next day. So we got all those petitions from around the country, and I set off just, just before sunrise at Wolf Pond. My friend Brendan, who took this picture, uh, he said to me, how heavy is your backpack? And I remember just quipping back to him, I hope it's heavy enough, because I wanted those letters to mean something to those people. 
So I made it to Boreas Ponds after a, just over a two mile bushwhack. You could see all of the logging roads are already rewilding. Made it past Marcy Swamp and up to, at the time, this was a November hike, to a frozen lake tier of the clouds, the highest pond source of the mighty Hudson River that would eventually flow into the Atlantic Ocean just past the Statue of Liberty. And it was during this walk that I got frustrated, really frustrated. I was mad. Adrenaline was coursing through my veins. I was mad that we needed to fight for a wilderness area in a world that has constantly had more people added to it and was constantly being more developed. I was mad that the land managers didn't see the innate values of New York State's remote spot. One of the few spots left that was three miles or more from a snowmobile trail on the road. I was really mad. And in the middle of the night, I was hiking through midnight, ice broke free from a rock precipice and smashed on the trail in front of me. And that's when the adrenaline really hit. <laughs> but as I went past that, that ice fall, I saw something in the snow that brought everything home to me. It was a, a print, a track, a moose track. We don't have as many moose in the Adirondacks, so there's only 400, I think, statewide in New York State. So that was a big deal for me, and I remembered in that moment that Forest Ponds needs to be wilderness. Not for me, that would be self-serving, but for the wildlife that calls the Boreas Ponds track home, and for the unborn generations of Americans who will inherit this place. I was surprised, honestly, when I got to the road that there was another group of wilderness advocates that met me there. Wasn't expecting this. And we all together carried that backpack with 1,882 letters, marched to the doorstep of the Adirondack Park Agency, and together we lifted this torch of preservation out of the pack and presented it on the podium to the APA commissioner. Thanks. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. But at least in me, I got to see what it's like to be active. And you know, you can't just wish for things to get better in your community. If you uh, try to grab a wish, you grasp nothing but air. So it was important for me to take a stab at grabbing a microphone, grabbing a pen, putting my backpack on, doing something tangible to protect those intangible qualities of wildness that we take for granted. Silence, solitude, remoteness, the fact that this is habitat for other creatures that call that place home. But there were other victories since my walk that I want to highlight, and one of them is special thanks to the Northeast Wilderness Trust. But the first involves another organization called Tompkins Conservation. And in January of 2018, Christine Tompkins, former uh, CEO of Patagonia, and now the head of Tompkins Conservation, uh, along with her late husband, Doug Tompkins, who helped found it, those two humans, along with Michelle Bachelet, then president of Chile, signed in January 2018 a 10 million acre wilderness pact. And with the swoop of a pen, that easy, new national parks were made. Old reserves were upgraded to national park and wilderness status. In an area nearly double the Adirondack Park was created overnight. And I was very lucky with the help of uh, Tom Butler of Tompkins Conservation to go see this newly rewilding landscape, just like the Boreas Ponds Track was rewilding. I got to go through Cerro Castillo National Park, Patagonia National Park. Patagonia National Park, a landscape that doesn't just protect the alpine highlands, but protects the lowlands, the prairies, places that are often scoffed at in conservation attempts. And just in the last 10 years since this land was protected by Tompkins Conservation, these once blackened soils are revitalizing and indigenous endemic wildlife is returning, like the guanacos, like the Darwin Rhea, like Puma. Mm. So when I got back from Patagonia, I was tempted to see how rewilding could work in New York State. Although Boreas Ponds wasn't saved as a full-blown wilderness landscape, we got close, we got half of it preserved as wilderness, thanks to the help of people across the state and across the country. 
I started to wonder, what if you were, and you pick your favorite animal? For me, it might be fishers. What if you were a fisher, and you were to lap water from Lake Champlain, and then in order to escape the irreparable harm of climate change, in order to find a mate to propagate your species, in order to find a habitat to raise your young safely in, away from people, predators, and cars with axles and wheels, how could one travel from Lake Champlain and move through a wild way to the Adirondack High Peaks region? I endeavored to try this. I convinced my friend Wade <laughs> to go to Willsboro Bay on Lake Champlain. We walked up Rattlesnake Mountain after visiting the state boat launch at Willsboro Bay. We then walked into the Taylor, Taylor Pond Wild Forest, summited Poco Moonshine, one of our cherished fire tower mountains in the eastern Adirondacks. You can see it from Burlington. And on the way, to seeing this new landscape, this hopeful Eagle Mountain Wilderness Preserve that was on the docket to potentially be purchased by the Northeast Wilderness Trust and to be saved in perpetuity as a forever wild wilderness landscape at 2,400 2, acres. That might not sound like a lot, but if this area would be saved as wilderness, you could walk to the heart of that preserve and get nearly 2.6 miles away from a road or snowmobile trail, which is Vermont's current wildest space possible statewide. So I wanted to see it for myself, and I wanted to fight for a new landscape that could potentially be protected in the Adirondacks. And as we marched to see the Eagle Mountain Wilderness Preserve, through the snow, and I'm used to seeing boundary tracks of Martin, they're all over the Adirondack Lodge and Heart Lake Program Center property. But these tracks were much bigger, much longer, but still had the bounder gate. And I was reminded of being a kid on Lake, Lake George and seeing that family of frolicking fishers. And lo and behold, after a decade, I see these fisher tracks again. And that underscores the importance of protecting this land. And here's the victory. If you want to go home and feel good, the Northeast Wilderness Trust on May 24th, 2019, purchased from the Rogers family the Eagle Mountain Wilderness Preserve. And I know a bunch of us in this room have heard about it or been there. There, and I gotta say this, this isn't one of those heralded alpine ecosystems. The Tetons, you know, the Sierras. No, this is an integral lowland wetland complex where coyotes, black bears, fishers, marten, American toads, American bullfrogs, and New York State safe fish, the brook trout, called the, the, and now can safely call the Eagle Mountain Wilderness Preserve home. So thank you, Northeast Wilderness Trust, for protecting New York's newest wilderness area. With 10 minutes to go, I have one more slide. And it's a slide, I think, appropriately of Boreas Ponds. Although we were unsuccessful in saving one of New York's last remaining remote places as a full wilderness area, uh, I have to harken back to going there for the first time. This was my first visit on the heels of getting off of the Appalachian Trail. I still had the golden locks from, sun, from being in the sun for a year. And while at White Lily Pond in the heart of this tract, you know, I couldn't help but think of being on the Pacific Crest Trail again in the Pasayton Wilderness. And I also, while on the Pacific Crest Trail, really felt like I was in that Dr. Seuss book. And you can't help but if you've read the Lorax to think of this scene as a vast array of, of truculent trees from the Lorax. But I also, on this first visit to the Boris Ponds track, I saw red fox tracks in the mud brown barbaloots, if you will. And if I may, I saw my first merganser family and American woodcock at the same time. I'd never seen an American woodcock or timber doodle before in my whole life. I'll call those, as Dr. Seuss would, the swami swans. <laughs> but we have to think about the submerged world of the hummingfish, or New York State state fish, the brook trout. And only 11% of brook trout habitat intact from its historical range in the eastern United States. But they currently live here in the Boreas Ponds tract, at least for now. 
And you can't help but remember back in the Lorax when the Lorax and the Lunkler are having this diatribe. And you know, who knows who's right? They're both a bit cruel to one another. But at one point, the Lorax argues, you're glumping the pond where the honeyfish hum. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gone. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and grow woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. But then, I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen to your dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say, bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you. I intend to go on doing just as I do, and for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring. I'm figuring, and figuring, and figuring, and figuring! Turning more truffula trees into needs, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs! And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall. The very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more needs, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now that was left neath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax. And I, the Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face as he hiked himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with the one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all my heart. But now, says the Wunstler, now that you're here, the word of the Lord act seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So catch, calls the ones there. He let something fall. It's a truffula seed. The last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds. And truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula. Treat it with care. Give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest. Protect it from axes that act. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come. I want to thank the North Branch Nature Center. I want to thank the Northeast Wilderness Trust, two admirable organizations with incredible mission statements that are doing the kind of good work that help make the world better every day, with every program, with every initiative. I like to believe that the Adirondack Mountain Club is doing that too in New York State. And we are all in this together. These little victories can happen with passionate people with conviction. Passionate people like you, passionate people like Billy Goat, passionate people like P2Ari's ancestors. We can all do it. And I just want to encourage you all and enliven you all to enjoy your public lands. Everything from the top of Mount Mansfield to the top of Mount Camel's Hump to Hubbard Park down the road. Every acre matters. And if not for you, it matters for the red squirrels, for the white breasted nut hat, and it, it matters for the kids that are going to grow up in these communities and get a, ch a chance, an opportunity to explore America's wild ones. I'll stick around for questions, and I'm happy to take some now, but thank you all very much. Thank you. So I, I also understand it's almost 8 o'clock. So if anyone has to depart, oh, no problem. Thank you for traveling all this way to come to the North Branch Nature Center tonight. Do come back. Uh, for the future presentations in the natural series. Uh, but I will happily stay up here for the next 
you know, 10 minutes and answer. Anything's on the table. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you for your passion. You're welcome. <laughs> I, yeah. I'll, I'll call my parents. Okay, okay. I want to ask a question. Uh, my first backpacking trip was in the Adirondacks. Really? It was wonderful. And I saw Green Martin, which I didn't even know what it was. Yes. And I go to the library and look it up. And you indicate that their population is doing very well. In New York State, yes, I know in Vermont, not as well. There not aren't as well. many American Martins in the state of Vermont. There are a lot of fishers. There are fishers, though, fishers. and that's okay. But fine Martins. Yes, I really hope that we have a good deep freeze this winter, so you get a few scampering founders across the lake and come back over to the Green Mountain State. But we are, thankfully, I see Martin tracks every time I go on a winter hike. The winter world reveals the mysteries of the wilderness, I believe, because suddenly the tracks are in the snow. And there are also tracking horses taught here, I should plug for, no, uh, for, for you all to know. But yes, there are plenty of American martins in the Adirondacks, and that's a great thing for biodiversity. It's part of the tapestry of life that we love in the Adirondack Park. Thank you for noticing that. Anyone else? Sometimes people just want to know how to eat food on the Appalachian Trail. But go ahead. Why in the world did you go south on the Pacific Crest? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Just like, yeah. So it is more popular to go northbound. I have some theories as to why. But I'll give you four reasons why you should consider a southbound through hike, at least on the Pacific Crest Trail. But many of these apply to the AT, maybe even the Long Trail as well. One, when you depart in the month of July, early, early, early July or late June, depending on the snowpack. The state of Washington is gorgeous in June, July, August. People in Seattle don't want you to know this. They have the best summers in the United States of America. It's when it hits October that you want to leave. Then it's just as rainy as Rochester, New York, and Florida knows, I know that's true. Um, but so the weather that time of the year in those states is fantastic. Meanwhile, the northbounders, if they don't get there until October 1st, they're sometimes blocked from Canada because of the falling snow in the Cascades. So Washington's beautiful in June and July. Second reason, the mosquitoes, by the time you start in July, half of them are dead. And as, as you go south, all of the mosquitoes down south have already hatched and been hopefully eaten. Um, so as you march south, you're walking through fewer and fewer mosquitoes. I found that to be attractive. Three, yes, fires are part of the life cycle of our Western ecosystems. And a lot of those ecosystems are fire climates meaning they're important, and that fires are supposed to happen there. Well, thankfully to the intrepid uh, volunteers and brave fire crews, the men and women who help put out those fires, most of the fires are put out for southbound hikers, but the northbound founders get them every single week. So you miss a lot of the forest fires. And then uh, finally, you get to the Sierras in September. All the kids have gone back to school. You get to walk through John Muir country, and no one else is there. Now, that's the limiting factor, getting past Mount Whitney before October 1st, or else you have the same problems the Northbounders do up at, uh, uh, in the Cascades. So uh, I started July, excuse me, June 6th, and walked 21.72 miles a day and missed the first snowstorm by one week. So uh, I could have started earlier in June, but the real reason why I went southbound wasn't, I didn't know those factors leading into it. The real reason is timing. If you have a window of opportunity, if you're at a crossroads in your life, for some people it's an educational milestone, for others you're between jobs or at retirement. Those are three decent crossroads to think of an ambitious through hike or El Camino, something like that. Uh, I actually finished grad school on June 24th, so I Turned in my final paper. It was too hot to start in the Mojave Desert in late June, but it's a perfect starting time for a south timer. So it just matters what timing is your crossroads at. If you could start in April, you go northbound. Uh, if you could start in June, you go southbound. Endless summer glee as you walk down towards the equator, essentially. So for me, it was timing. Grad school ended on June 24th. Too hot in the summer to go to the Mojave, perfect for the Cascades. So I got lucky, I guess. Beginner's luck, if you will. Is there another place in the world where you would really love to trek through wilderness? Yes, honestly, my next goal, truly, is the long trail. 
of Vermont. Yes, of all the world. You know why, though? I feel like in Burlington, you get the best sunset every day. In the Adirondacks, if you're an early riser, you get the best sunrise every morning over Lake Champlain. And when you hike the mountains in the Adirondacks, do you know what we look at? You all. We look at the Green Mountains. We look at the silhouette of the Green Mountains. And you know what's on that silhouette? The Long Trail. So uh, ever since uh, December 22nd, 2006, when I climbed my first high peak, in 2006, wow, um, I've stared at the Green Mountain enchainment with admiration, yet I just haven't had the time. And uh, I just got to either save up three weeks or so of vacation. Uh, or uh, maybe be between jobs, but that's my next one, the long trail, 270 miles of mountain bleed. Yeah, it's not funny to hear that, but that's what I would really love to do. Just because of, I always see it, I'd love to actually experience it. Been on parts of it. The AT and the long trail overlap for the southern 105 miles from the Massachusetts border to Killington, but then at Main Junction, the AT dogs east towards uh, Woodstock and Humphrey. Uh, and if you go north from there, you're heading up towards uh, Camel Sump territory, so and beyond. Great question. I would love to do. I'd love to know what you want to do. I'm looking for ideas. Up the Tenth Mountain Trail. Where is it? Is it in? Oh, Vail to Aspen. It's in Colorado. So the Tenth Mountain Division huts are up there. You yeah. know what I'd like to do yeah, there do. if I ever live out there? Ski. I would do it by ski. Yeah, it's yeah. Cool. hut to hut. Yeah, that would be amazing. Well, it's just after 8. I'm going to stay up here and just hang out for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, as long as the North Branch Nature Center lets me before they give me the boot. Thank you all very much for coming.